Welcome to our eighth and final session of Sing Smart. Tonight we are going to have three topics. I would say they're basically unrelated, but there are three things that I want to make certain that we cover during this class. The first is I'm going to talk to you about expectations as choral singers. The second is some musical forms and textures that you as choral singers need to have a little bit of knowledge about. And the third is we are going to do some sight singing. We are going to review the process that I want you to go through as you work during these months where we can't really get together and rehearse. You need to be doing some sight singing. So let's get started. You collectively create an instrument. You are a choral instrument as a group. It's made up solely of human beings, and it's up to each of you as singers to make this instrument the best it can be. So there are some expectations that I need you to follow. Make your chorus a high priority. I think most of you in the oratorio group do that, but there are always a few that float in and uh, don't take it as seriously as I think it should be taken. Meet your attendance requirements. If you miss more than three rehearsals for a concert, you are technically not supposed to be able to sing. Um, with my permission, that can be overruled, but the, it's not fair to other singers. So be true to your group. Arrive early or at least on time for rehearsals and concerts. Be a team player. Listen to the voices around you. Fit into the ensemble. Pay attention to entrances, cutoffs, and mark them. Use your best choral techniques in singing always. Last week you had a fabulous class with Robin Rockhein about choral resonance and, and just general singing and warm-ups. Use that technique that she is showing you and use it in every rehearsal and in every performance the whole time. That takes energy. Do it, please. Breathe properly. What you do immediately before you begin singing a note and the way you take your breath is important. Consciously breathe out by pulling your stomach in and trying to time things so that you take a good deep breath early enough to fill your lungs, but not so early that you end up having to hold your breath. Keep the airflow moving so that you in inhale and turn the breath around and exhale in a gentle swoop, not with inhale, hold your breath, and then let it out. That is not the, what is good for your singing or your body. As you breathe, think about the first sound that you are going to make and try to shape your mouth accordingly before you sing the sound. Finding your starting pitches. If I could tell you of a foolproof way to find your note, I promise I would. I really would. There are times that it's obvious. Other times, it's just plain difficult. Often you may hear your note sung or played just prior to your entrance. If not, look for your note in the accompaniment or in another voice part. Even if it's an octave higher or lower, that can give you a hint to your, to your pitch. Take the note, the hint, circle that note, bring it down to your entrance note, and realize the relationship between the two, whether it's an octave higher, whether it's the exact same pitch. Be ready. If you cannot find the actual note, look for another note that you can use to help find the correct interval. You can bounce off a certain note and say, I'm going to go a major third above that note. Use that as your cue. Circle that note. Put major third beside it and draw a line to your entrance so that you can find your pitch yourself. It really is not a good idea to rely on the person standing next to you for your note. In rehearsals at the beginning when you're learning something, if you're having difficulty, it, it's useful to sing next to someone that can find their pitch. But in a performance, this damages rhythmic integrity and what happens if that person is sick for the performance? You're lost. You need to be self-reliant and find a way to mark your score so that you can do this on your own. Think of intonation, vibrato, and dynamics 
before you begin to sing. One, one thing that um, uh, Robin gave us, excuse me, I just want to say Robin gave us a lot of hints about intonation, and I think you should take those to heart. Another thing that can help you, if you're not certain you're hearing yourself clearly, because as Robin described, the sound you hear in your face is so close to your ears that you don't always hear exactly what comes out. Take one finger, plug up one ear, and you can sometimes hear the note that you're singing a little more clearly, especially with pitch. Don't be afraid to do that in rehearsal, of course, only. I took this next statement directly from your text. Lyrics are usually placed immediately under the voice part, except when all the voice parts are written on two staves, a technique known as a short score. In short score, in the case of a piece for mixed voices, sopranos and altos share the top staff, tenors and basses share the bottom one. In this case, the lyrics will usually be in between. Well, that's all fine. But if the word settings for each part, for each voice part is different, sometimes the soprano text is above and the tenor text is above their notes, while the alto text and the bass text is underneath. Sometimes you get a combination of this. This short score business is difficult. In that case, it's very important to take a highlighter, mark your text with the notes that you sing with them. This, this kind of notation, and it's an editor's notation, causes a lot of trouble in sight reading, I think. Um, it can be done. It saves trees, but it's not something I look for. Try to avoid it, but if we ever have to deal with it, be prepared ahead of time and have your score marked. Another thing that Robin talked about is keeping the corners of your mouth this way in. And she had an old, her own little symbol that she showed you, the, the oval kind of look with the little tuck it in things here. I want to tell you to think of north and south. You should always be singing in this direction, not in this direction. She used a pencil or a pen or something and, had, and, and sang some this way. I won't sing for you. You're fine. But the truth is your whole face needs to be this in this tall direction to make your vowels come out beautifully. I have um, a friend of mine that sings in one of my choruses, a very nice man, and um, he's been singing his entire life. But I look up sometimes and when he sings E's, his lips are out to his ears. You know, and, and I can just tell you that I know what kind of sound is coming out of his face. And, and, and it's impossible to think of your mouth coming this way and to keep a tall sound, north and south. That's your job. Please do it. Posture. Maintain proper posture during rehearsals as well as in concerts. Without proper posture, there's no way that you can sing up to your full potential. I want you to try this, to, to get into a standing position. Stand as though you are against a wall with the outside of your shoulders and the back of your hips touching the wall. The middle and lower back do not touch the wall. The chest is up and out. And when I say the chest is up and out, this, this collarbone is, is lifted, not your shoulders. One of the things I think helps is to stretch as high as you can and bring, bring your shoulders down, bring your arms down and that generally keeps this, this bone up high, which gives you more room for the airflow to happen. Keep that chest bone high, not shoulders high. The stomach is <clears throat> as flat as is natural for you. I thought that was a nice way to say it. The head is erect, looking straight ahead. One foot is slightly ahead of the other, and the music is held out chest high with arms not squeezed to the side. They should not, your arms should not be pushed into your rib cage, but, that, but your music should be held up chest high. When looking at the music, only your eyes should look down to see it. We should not see a chorus of heads bobbing down to look at the notes. For one thing, all of that motion will cause you to lose your place. If you have your music in the right proper position, 
your eyes can look down and you can almost see the conductor and the score at the same time. It also helps as a megaphone to help toss your, your beautiful voice out into the audience. It's very important. This is true in rehearsal as well as in performance. The worst thing you can do is to sit with your folder in your lap. It, it, it causes your entire inside to collapse. You can't see the conductor. Your voice can't be heard, so I don't know if it's helping or hurting. And it's just not a good thing. I had one choir member <clears throat> that, that had trouble holding his folder. He had had shoulder surgery. We put a music stand up for him so he could still have his music stand up in the proper position so that he could see and sing properly. Sing while you're sitting. Singing while you're sitting is just fine as long as you keep the upper part of your body in the same position as if you're standing. You, can, you should sit on a third to a half of the seat with your feet in front of you, never with your legs crossed. And again, one foot slightly in front of the other. It helps with your balance and it, and in both cases, uh, standing or sitting. And if, you're, if you are seated with one foot, I don't know if you can see me, but if, if you're seated with one foot in front of you and your hands are full of music, you can stand quietly without making a, a rumble sound on a riser, which echoes like a timpani. You can sit and stand one foot ahead, slightly separated, silently. Practice that. It's very important. And if you have aches and pains and you stand a little more slowly, you have to anticipate just a smidge. We have to look sharp doing that. Maintain your vocal health. We heard about this from Robin as well last week. Use your voice daily. If you sing 20 minutes a day, whether it's in the shower, whether you warm up in the car, whether you just vocalize a little bit, it will keep your voice in shape. Right now during this pandemic, it's difficult to sing. It's one of the things we cannot do as a group but you can do it individually. And I ask you to continue to do that. Stay hydrated and healthy. Maybe you do. I, I never have been one that would drink enough water. And so I'm trying to be a better girl. One of the things Robin told you last week was that if you're gonna hydrate before a rehearsal, before singing, it's important to do it two hours prior to singing, not so much the moment that the rehearsal begins. Be mindful of sections that need your attention in rehearsal. Mark your score. If there's a section that you can't get the notes, at some point the, the director cannot stop a rehearsal for your, for your wrong notes. You must go home and work these out. We're going to review some sight reading. Some of you play the piano. Some of you can get online and get these parts. There are many ways to discover um, that you can discover that can help you find your pitches if you're having trouble with a certain section. I say circle it, put a question mark, and that's the spot you come back to before the next rehearsal. I would say to seek professional coaching or lessons. Um, I think it's important that you realize that we all are learning. It's a learning process. The aging voice needs more um, help and knowing how to, to maintain the good sound and, and to keep our muscles in, in sync. I think it's always helpful to have someone listen to you and give you advice. I think um, Robin Rockline would be a fabulous voice teacher. I just had to get that little pun in for her. If you're sick, sit in the audience and listen to a rehearsal. Take your pencil and make notes. If you're so sick that you cannot attend a rehearsal, prior to the next rehearsal, get your markings from your section leader. It's very important not to come into a rehearsal and, and destroy what has been um, accomplished the, in the previous rehearsal. Even if you're sick, we want you back. We want you back with the knowledge that you've missed. Please be diligent about this. Some other things you can do to be prepared for rehearsals. Listen to recordings of the work that we're going to perform. Prior to the rehearsed rehearsal, 
it's very exciting to have a score and read through the score with a recording. With YouTube, you can find most anything and listen to, listen to several. Often you'll find totally different recordings, different tempo, different styles. It's very interesting to do that and very helpful. Study your notes. I mean like the notes on the paper, like the notes on the staff. Find online parts, use your sight singing skills. Be prepared with as much note reading prior to rehearsal as possible. Between rehearsals, review the previous week's markings and notes. Read something historical about the work. Now here's one, write the English translation in your score. I think it's important to know what you're singing about. However, it, it, can, be, it can be tight to have two languages in there. So I would say, write the translation, especially the main, the main words, the main ideas, and then highlight the language that you will be singing. Highlight the one you'll be singing, especially if you have a translation in your score. Prepare page turns. This is a funny thing. Um, your text has like three pages, page 34 through 37, on nothing but page turns. And I'm going to ask you to look at that. I don't totally agree with every idea of that, but the idea of clipping the corner off of every other page so that you can stick your thumb under that while you're doing that, and it gives you the advantage. You're not grabbing and, and squeezing to find a single page, but your thumb will reach under carefully and then you can turn. The thing I don't like about what it suggests in your book is that it says something about taking the entire book over to turn the page. Well, if you have your book in a folder, which you should, you cannot close your entire folder to turn that page. You need to use your thumb under those page turn um, options. But I do think to have some sor sort of um, method to turn these pages without all the rustle and bustle that that can happen. Let's see. Oh, I turned my page while I was talking about page turns. Clip together solo material. In oratorios and the works we generally do, there are pages of solos. Get a clip even before rehearsals begin and, and clip them together. We won't be singing those pages. Always. I'm saying it five times. Always have a pencil. If you come to a rehearsal without a pencil, you might as well stay home. It's part of what you have to have as a choral singer. Mark your scores. Most singers develop their own way of annotating their score, and that's just fine. But you have to mark your score. I don't care how great you are. You can't remember everything. That, that goes on in a rehearsal. You can't remember every breath mark or every shape. It's just uh, pretty much impossible. And I just don't think it's fair to the others that do go to the trouble to, to mark their scores so that they can repeat what they have been told. Prior to rehearsals, mark your line in each system. You can, you can use a little asterisk, you can use a check, you can use a highlighter, but know where your line is in a score. I'm going to give you a few what I think are helpful suggestions for how to mark your score. Like I say, if you have a method that works for you, I'm not here to change it, but I am here to make sure you're doing it. Mark a retard, retard or retardando with a squiggly horizontal line across the bars where the slowdown should occur. And I literally mean a squiggly little line, like this. Yeah. That means to retard. It also means to look up at the conductor, because a retard can't happen in a chorus altogether if we don't have one leader that's, that's instructing each of us how, how slow to go, and how, how, how much time, how slow from here to here, is, how much is going to change between that. So mark that. The little word R-I-T can be lost in a big score. If your part enters on an unexpected, in, at an unexpected place, draw a picture of a pair of glasses immediately before as a warning, or put an arrow, a big arrow before it, 
something that you can see to say, oh my goodness, the sopranos enter here, the altos enter here, and the basses enter, you know, a measure and a half later, instead of on the downbeat, in the middle of a measure. I have to be ready. And so don't, don't get lost in your score. Have those entrances marked very clearly. If your part enters just after a page turn, extend the staff at the bottom of the page and, and write your note on it. Write the pitch, write the text, so that you are ready for an entrance. There are two ways you can do this. You can either extend out, you know, you could go, I don't know, like right here, you could make another measure and add another note right there. Or you could say, that's the same note as that, turn early. You could write a turn here or turn quickly or something so that you are prepared for your entrance on the next page. Never be caught by a surprise entrance. Be ready. Color dynamic markings. Sometimes editors put a P or a, a, a F, a piano or a forte or some variants of that in between parts. And it's supposed to mean for both parts or it, it's small and, and, and it's lost in there. Take a red pen or a highlighter and circle that so you can see that. It's very important that you know where these dynamic markings are. The abbreviation for crescendo and diminuendo is like four little letters, C-R-E-S-C, -E is all you get. It's usually in, in, in little, little tiny thin print, or you get a D-I-M. Well, if you can see better than I and read 25 things at one time, that's fine. But I really believe it's worth taking a pencil or a marker and drawing the crescendo to the point at which it ends or the point at which it's headed. Now, I, I cheat. I don't always draw the bottom of a crescendo. That's, cause, that's just, just in my way. But if it's, if it's a crescendo, I will draw a line headed up. If it's a diminuendo, all I need is a line going down, that part of a diminuendo. But draw something so that you know that you're supposed to be diminishing or crescendoing through that, through that point. Mark your breath spots, a comma or a check. Often you have a rest, but often your director has to tell you where they want a breath mark, within a phrase um, or maybe not within a phrase. Sometimes it's just not obvious in the way scores are notated. So make sure you mark those. Don't assume that you will do it properly. Please just, it doesn't take a second. Every phrase has a, a climax or a peak. And what I would say in a phrase is to, I draw a mountain. I believe that a, the, the peak of a phrase is usually heading to that point, whether it's dynamically pushing to that point, whether it's rhythmically pushing to that, that point, whether the text is driving you to the most important word in the phrase. But I think it's worth Drawing, and this is where I draw a mountain. If this is my phrase, we talked about phrases last time. If it's over a four measure phrase and it starts here, oftentimes the peak of the phrase is toward a little past the middle of the phrase. Not always, but usually it's past the middle. And, and it's often a high note. It may not be a high note in your part, but it may be a high note in someone's part. Anyway, or the text is important. I draw a mountain to that point and then let the mountain come down. Not to be confused by a little crescendo down here in your score. But the mountain is for the whole phrase. And that's where the direction, the line needs to head to this peak. I think it's worth knowing where you're headed. Slash lines for staccato or marcato artic articulation. It's very easy to... Um, Say we wanted this to be marcato right in here. I'm just going to make this up, okay? We wanted these separated. Just little slash lines. Little slash lines. However far we want them separated. Little slash lines will remind you that they are separated. Don't be afraid to mark your score. Be afraid to sing it incorrectly instead. 
If you have a measure that is difficult rhythmically, there are times that it's helpful to mark the beats in the measure. Say there are four beats in this measure. If this was difficult, you could put one, two, three, four. It's not such a difficult measure. Another thing that can help is instead of writing the numbers out, to simply put on the beat one, two happens in the middle there, three is on that note, and four is on that note. Now in your book, it mentions drawing these little lines, but it suggests that these little lines come prior to the beat. I say it's better to put those little lines on the note which is absolutely on that beat. That's my opinion. If you're used to the other way, I'm not going to tell you it's wrong, but these little lines are a quick way to identify where the pulses are in a measure, and I think they're important. We've talked about the entrance. Circle enharmonic changes. We've talked about enharmonic, uh, enharmonic notes, and that is, it's, it's to say, um, this is a C sharp because of the key signature. This is a C sharp. If this were a D flat, it's not. But if it were a D flat right here, the C sharp and the D flat are the same pitch. It happens. It happens in the, the grammar of musical uh, uh, theory. It happens if there's a key change in the piece. So it can happen. I would say if that's the case, C sharp, D flat, I'm not going to change this one. But circle them and, 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 and put same or put something, but circle them perhaps. In fact, one of the things I like to do is circle all repeated notes. You see, I did it right in here, right? Two circles, those are notes of the same, the same, the same, the same. Look how many repeated notes you have. You can tell I teach young children piano. I believe that's a helpful tool. We'll get to more of that in a minute. Okay. Right into your score, don't move until the instrumental portion is finished with the movement. There are times and, 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 and many times that the, the orchestra or the accompanist has a tag at the end of a movement or a work. The chorus should not move. It shouldn't turn the page to the next section. It shouldn't act like, oh, it doesn't matter. I can relax and not stand properly. You should stand just as you have been, as if you were going to sing another whole section. But write in your score, don't move. Circle wrong notes and add that question mark as you go through rehearsal. I've already mentioned that. Go back and look at them before the next one. Repeat marks are easy to miss, especially if, they're, if, if, if the repeat is five pages ahead of where you're going back to. And that happens in, in, in music. So I'm going to say, if you had a repeat sign, let's make this a repeat sign right here. This is a repeat sign. And you're going to go have to go back four pages to here, OK? I would put, you'd have the dots. I'm going to put dot space and dots here. Say you're going back four pages to that. I would put these little chevron marks like that. And I put them again here. If it's back four pages, I'd put back four pages so that you know at this point. Otherwise, you can be totally lost. And if you get lost in some scores, you're in trouble. Mark it. Don't be afraid to mark. Often in oratory or singing, scores have many voice parts. Go through your score, marking your part. Arrows, asterisks, highlights, I don't care. There are also different numbers of stabs because of the many parts on a page. Every once in a while, one page, one page of score will have two systems, okay? That means two sets of vocal parts, two sets of accompaniments, and, and they're separated, but, you, and they, but they can be crammed on one page. The next page may have only one system, a little more spread out, or adding more vocal parts or something, and, and then you don't know. The most dangerous one I think happens is when you've got two systems or a system and then a page of interlude, which is just a keyboard part in your score probably, 
It's easy to think that's the accompaniment part down below. You turn the page ready to sing, but the orchestra has their own little solo right there as an interlude or the accompanist, and you're singing on top of them. So I would say, I, I, I like to mark, um, I mean, I would call this a system sort of, and you can do any kind of marking you want. You can do a, a line here. You can do a big line here, because this one, this one has two lines. This little exercise, has three lines, this one has two. But mark in some way so that this doesn't look like one continuous thing. It's very important to know where you are. Editors will often insert numbers or bold print letters, usually in circles or in little squares, like an uppercase A in a square box. These or, or it can be a number. It can be a, a one, two, three, or whatever. Um, they often do this to indicate sections for you. It's also helpful in rehearsals because it might be easier to say, find A, except I wouldn't say it like this, and then go back six measures. I'd say six before A, you'd have to find A and count back six measures. It, it's to ex expedite rehearsal time and to help everyone find the place. I tend to take these little, these little um, letters or, or numbers that are in, encased in boxes or circles and put them in a color. You know, I will put them in a pink highlighter so that if I'm looking for A, I can, it may be back four pages because it's not usually on the same page. But m mark it with a color so you can look back pink. I know I've got to find that pink A and then I can find my spot quickly. Measure numbers. Many scores include measure numbers. Often when they do, they only include them at the beginning of each line, each system, or sometimes it's at the top of the system, sometimes it's before your individual um, part. Some, some editors do not include measure numbers, and I'm going to encourage you before any rehearsal to go through your score and make sure you have measure numbers marked. It saves so much time in rehearsal. I think in one of our sessions, we talked about the fact that some measures have only a, a portion of a, of a measure at the beginning. None of these are like that. But only a portion of a measure. And that little portion, if it had just this pickup quarter note, da, one, two, three, four, it would end up with uh, a, a, a half note dot in this measure. One, two, three, four, one. But this little tiny measure is not counted as a measure because you want to make sure you start correctly or you end up a measure off with everyone. So make sure you have your, your measures numbered before rehearsals. Remind yourself to hold a note to its full value by drawing an arrow to the point of release. Well, this is a little bit confusing here because I had to add this. I couldn't get the copy machine to do what I was hoping to make it happen. So this, is, this looks weird, but this is a half note, and normally you would hold that note to the downbeat of the next measure, and if the word was Lord, you might put a D here, especially if it's two pages later, or you've got a long melismatic passage that you're going to sing on, ah, you've turned two pages and there's a D at the end of Lord. You've forgotten which word you're on by that point. So mark it, mark it. This little, this little long arrow here indicates make sure I hold that note full value. It should be off on the downbeat of the next measure in this case. Be ready. Mark that. Mark accented and unaccented notes and syllables. You know, when you speak, you say the word father. Father. The fa has the accent in the English language, and a good composer will make sure, sure that that word, the accent, falls on a, on a strong beat in the music. That's what separates the men from the boys so often in musical um, writing. And so this would be have a strong, and the the, would, I put a little u like, an unaccented sound. We talked about accents and unaccents in a two-note slur. Remember, the first had the accent, and the second in a two-note slur generally has that. A word like father would be how that would be used. There are times that you need to mark unaccented notes and unaccented syllables 
in your score. Mark every directive given by your conductor. Amen. That's all I want to say about that. Please mark your scores and please pay attention to your mark. I'm going to ask you to move to handout number 19. I just want to take just a couple of minutes, since this is our last class, to talk about a couple of musical forms. We have um, uh, I've touched base on a couple of them, but because this is what we sing, I want to make sure that you have some understanding. I think it's important for us as oratorio singers to know that the church has been the major consum consumer of choral music over many centuries. The Christian church is responsible for commissioning many of the great choral works in the past and still in the present day. And that is why most of the music that we sing is religious in nature. I'm going to go through and talk about some musical forms. We haven't done a Bach cantata, but we've sung a couple of pieces from Bach cantatas in, in smaller concerts. Um, a cantata is a relatively short dramatic work for chorus and soloist. It is sung without costumes or without action. Usually they're not accompanied by orchestra. Sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. But often they're accompanied by just an organ because Mr. Bach was the man that wrote so many cantatas that when I think of the word cantata, I think of Bach. He wrote over 200 cantatas that are still surviving today. He wrote over 200. He wrote his, com I have to tell you this about Bach, it's not where I'm supposed to be going with this, but the church has three cycles of lectionary texts. They're called lectionary year A, B, and C. Over those three years, it basically covers, I won't say every, every, um, every phrase in the Bible, but it basically covers the Bible. That's the goal, to cover the Bible in that three-year lectionary. And many denominations follow the same lectionary. Bach wrote three cycles of cantatas. He wrote three cycles of cantatas. I'd say his cantatas are about 20 to 25 minutes long. That's a lot of music to compose for every week of the church year for three years. It's just amazing. And because he was part of the Reformation, he was in Germany, he wrote 40 choral cantatas, which means that they're based on chorales. I should have said chorale cantatas. They're based on the form, the chorale, which is like what we call a hymn, which is when they started using hymns in worship because the congregation was participating. They, he would take a chorale theme and write an entire work on that called a cantata, which was used in worship at the time. A mass. Robin touched on um, the parts of a mass at one point early on when we had her for as a guest and it is the central service of the Roman Catholic rites. It's usually five or six movements, Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus and Benedictus and on you stay. Sometimes the Sanctus and the Benedictus are combined into one movement. But we sing masses. We've sung masses by Mozart, Haydn, Rossini, Bach, Beethoven. Most every um, First class composer has written a mass. There are thousands of them out there. And they, they, they came as a result of the church and the Catholic church. And some of the masses were composed to be part of the, of the service. Some were more like concert masses. But it's certainly a format that took off and is a format that we sing. That's why we sing these. The Requiem is a mass for the dead in the Roman Catholic rites. The name Requiem comes from the beginning words of the introit. Requiem eternum dona eis domine. Give them re eternal rest, O Lord. The Requiem is different from the regular Mass in that it only includes certain items of the ordinary. The Kyrie Sanctus Agnus Dei. 
the joyful parts of the Gloria and the Credo are omitted in, in the, in the um, Requiem Mass. Um, it does include the intro and the gradual of the proper for the day. The Dies Irae is, means day of wrath. In the regular Mass, they're Alleluia's. In the Requiem Mass, they're not Alleluia's. The Dies Irae takes the place of that, day of wrath. You can only imagine what a composer can do with the day of wrath. It's the most dramatic part of almost every Requiem Mass that I've ever been a part of. A Passion. Some years ago, we sang the St. Matthew Passion. This is a setting that reflects the gospel story of the crucifixion of Jesus. And there again, I think of, Mar of, of Bach with his passions. I think it's interesting, the St. Matthew Passion is probably the most famous passion that there is, I would say, and the most famous of Bach's passion. It was never heard outside of Leipzig until it was performed in an abbreviated form by Felix Mendelssohn a century after it was composed. Hard to believe, but it was Felix Mendelssohn who brought that back to life. And it's usually, it's, I shouldn't say usually, it's often done in an abbreviated form because it's so blooming long. We did it in an abbreviated form for sure. An oratorio. <clears throat> we call ourselves Tampa Oratorio Singers. An oratorio is a large musical composition for choir, soloist, and orchestra. It's really just like an unstaged opera. We have no costumes. We have no sets. I've thought about trying to take an oratorio and add that for fun, and just to see how it would be. It might be fun someday. But you think about Messiah. You think about Israel in Egypt by Handel. You think about Haydn's creation. You think about the story of Elijah by Mendelssohn. These are what we call oratorio in its form. A motet is a piece of music sung in several parts. Most anything can be called a motet, quite frankly. Um, uh, many date back to the Renaissance period. Um, and there again, our Mr. Bach, our Mr. Bach has seven surviving motets, and they're all fabulous. We've done a couple of them, I think. A uh, todayum is the Latin for we praise thee, O God. It's another composition based on religion that is a, is a praise piece. We've done the Dvorak Todayim. We've done the Handel Todayim. There, there are many, many Todayims written. They're all about the praise of God. A madrigal. Madrigals are short polyphonic songs, often on fanciful themes. They are not always religious, and they began in Italy in the 1500s. We have done some madrigal songs during the Christmas holidays when we do carols. Many of those go back and are great fun to sing. I would say they're not religious. It's one of the few non-religious things that an oratorio group sings, I would say. They're polyphonic. And that takes us into a couple of words I want you to hear about texture. Polyphony or counterpoint. Contrapuntal or poly polyphonic music is musical texture where there are two or more musical lines that move independent of each other. Polyphonic music it can, can often begin with a stretto or almost like a canon where the voices enter independently and have the same theme, maybe starting in a different, on a different pitch. Or one may be upside down from the other. Or one may be twice as slow as the other. Or one might be twice as fast as the other. Diminution, augmentation. These, or you can combine all of the above. Um, when I was in graduate school, we were given a puzzle. And someone had taken a piece of Bach apart. And it said, write this line in this key. Four measures later, write it in the same key upside down. Two measures later, started a fifth higher than it was. I don't know. Six measures later, play it in diminution, which means twice as fast. Every note value is doubled. And then one, a retrograde meant backwards. 
You could play it backwards, upside down, and twice as slow. It all together fit and created a piece of music. I give credit to Bach. I have my whole life. I can't find that, that exercise. I'd love to find it and try to do it again. Great fun. But that's counterpoint. Homophonic music, in contrast, is more like the German chorale. Homophonic music, I think of hymns. A homophonic music has a melodic line, and it has, it has um, chords under it, basically, where, the, where the, the rhythm is basically the same throughout. Not totally, but basically the same. You think of a hymn. They're clunk, 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 clunk. You might have a one part that does a little something more interesting. But they're based on the chord structures more than they are on independent voices interweaving. So those are two textures that you need to know about as singers because those are two textures that we work with day in and day out. Enough about that. Now, I've been talking about sight singing for eight weeks and the importance of sight singing. And it's been hard because I talk too much and I'm not going to do that today. I want to get into some sight singing for you. I want to review a couple of things that I think are important. The first is to think about count singing. We did a little bit of count singing at our, at our first meeting, I believe it was. I want you to look at count singing again because we're going to have to do some of this. When you look at count singing, I want you to look at this. This is an example in, in your packet. It is, count singing is, let me see if I can tell you. It's handout number three and I'm on the top of that, uh, the right hand column. It's in two, four time. The first thing you must look at is, is the, the time signature. How many beats are in a measure? What kind of note is getting one beat? We're not worried about the key signature in this. We're worried about the time signature in this. We're separating this out completely. The next thing you have to look at when you're going to do some count singing is what is the smallest division of notes in, in a section or a piece? And in this case, we have one and two e and a. So this beat is divided into quarters. So to me, that is, that is the, 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 the beginning point of count singing for this little piece. So if you were to begin count singing this, I would suggest that you go, one e and a two e and a one e and a two e and say all the e and as. I say duh instead of uh, but your book says uh. One e and a two e and a one e and a two e and a one e and a e and a one e and a and a. Now look, this is an eighth rest. One of the main things about count singing is there is no sound that should come out of your mouth on a rest or a breath. That's one of the things that will help you notate exactly where you're to breathe in this as you're learning, okay? So you can continue with this, one e and a, and I would tell you to keep counting the one e and the two e and with the, with the notes in your head, pointing to the notes in some form, not trying to sing the pitches yet, but one e and a two e and a one e and a two e and a one e and a e and a one e and a and a. You see that? The next step in count singing, I think, should move beyond that. If this were to go fast, it, you'd wear yourself out on the one e and a two e and a one e and a two e and a. And 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 in this little piece, how many times do you need the division? of a quarter note to be cut in fourths. You need it in this measure. You need it in this measure. You see it there? You need it in this measure. You need it in this measure. So the next step in count singing this would be to go to divide the beat into halves instead of into quarters. So you would go one and two e and a one and two and one and two and 
one and and one and two and one and two and one and and one and two and one e and a two and a. now look you've got the little rest a sixteenth rest so it's one e and a two and a. do you see that so that's getting one of the quarters that's getting one quarter of silence and that's getting two quarters as an eighth keeping going one and two and one e and a two and a. that doesn't look right I left off something there. That one doesn't count. One and two and a one. That's the two E and a. One and two E and a one. Do you see that? So this is count singing. We're going to take music, new scores, when we get back together, and some of you fight me on this, but those days are gone. We're going to do this at every rehearsal. Five minutes, three minutes. You will learn to count. If you don't know how to count, you usually don't have to count above six for your whole life. And it's usually more like four. So I think you can handle this. I will not give up on this. Are you ready? The next thing I want to talk about is two methods of sight singing. And I want you to do some of this on your own. I've got some I'd like to try. But I'd like to give you two ideas in sight singing help. This is the method that I think, well, I shouldn't say. Each method has its good points and its bad points. And the truth is, combining methods is probably the best way to sight sing. When you sight read, determine the key that the piece is in. Now, if you can look at your handout number 10 on, on, on um, exercise number 4, it starts with three flats, okay? Now I'm going to use this to tell you what I want you to do over here. This is a two-liner. I messed up the end a little bit. But we have a key signature that has three flats. Remember the three flats? Count down a fifth. B, E, A. Three flats. B flat, E flat, A flat. The next to the last flat is the major scale that you would be in. It could be in a minor scale. But the last note is the E flat. The first note is the E flat. And thank goodness your book tells you that finger, I mean not finger, but that the first degree of the scale, number one, it tells you, is that E flat. We are in the scale of E flat for this. So following this pattern, you've determined the key. Spell out the scale with the degree numbers and note names. I did this right here for you because I want you to see that this is a process that you should go through. Here's your key signature, and we're starting on E. That's number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You don't even have to put the accidentals in. It's in the key signature for you. But you need to know that these are the degrees of the scale. Remember we talked about all the degrees in a scale. So write the, write the scale degrees under that. And then come back to this piece of music, and we're going and, to, and, and if you've got room, where can I show you this? I tried to write this. Your book shows you writing these scale degrees between the lines. I knew you couldn't see that. I would say write it out on a piece of staff paper so you can see it. And then you can look at these and figure out, if you can't just identify that, that's a 1, that's an 8, that's a 7, that's an 8. That's a one, go down one, that's a seven. That's a seven an octave higher. So what I want you to see is that you can name these notes by the scale degrees, by looking at this, okay? We're not there yet because before you, after you do this, you should count sing the rhythm. You should count sing the rhythm. That means look at the time signature. This is in cut time. There are two ways I would tell you to count this. I would tell you to count it in quarter notes first. Just because it's easy. So to count, sing this. One, two, three, four. 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 
Because it's in cut time, which means 2-2 two, two time, I would then tell you that I think you should count it as 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 and 1 and 2 and. Remembering that cut time is 2-2 two, two time, right? Okay. The next thing I would tell you to do is then locate the degrees on the staff. And that means use this that you've written out, if you can't do it in your head, and write the numbers of the scale degrees on the score as you're learning something. So that would be one, two, three, four. I believe in circling repeats. I think I've said that to you already. I circle the repeats. It makes my life easier. One, two, three, four, five, 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 six, five, four, three, four, three, two, Two, three, four, five, six, 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 five, five, four, two, one, three, one. Do you see what I'm doing there? I'm simply saying the notes of the scale. I ask you at this point to go back and think about, you know, we went one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one. You should be able to think one, three, one, one, four, one. One, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one, five, one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Go back to that little exercise. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, seven, one, one, two, three. That will help you when you're singing from these numbers that you've identified. Okay? Take the time to look at that and mark that. Then it tells you to find and play the tonic. Well, I'm not going to tell you you have to find and play the tonic. My voice range is pretty um, um, minimal, and it doesn't matter what I start on as long as I know where one is, and I'm in a major scale, I sing a major scale, because I just did that for you. So make sure you're ready to do it this way. And then you sing one, two, three, four, five, 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 six, five, four, and sing the numbers. I was hoping to do more of this, but I'm not going to do too much of this, because I want to get into the, the other method a little bit. The other method, to think about, um, that's that one. The other method is an intervallic method. I think singing by intervals is wonderful and sometimes it's better. It's not, it's not always better. I think that um, in, your school, in your book, it talks about determining whether it's a major third or a minor third and when it's a skip. I think if you're in the key signature, it's pretty easy to think of a major scale or a minor scale instead. I want you to look, I, I want to tell you two things before we end today. One is, I want you to look at intervals. Your book has the most involved page of intervals that I've ever seen. It's wonderful. And if you can memorize all of those and remember which is which, more power to you. I think that's a lot of wasted energy, frankly. I think to know the intervals in a major scale is important. I want to remind you that major intervals can go up, major and perfect intervals can go up to an, a half step and become augmented intervals. Major and minor intervals go down a half step to become, um, major intervals go down a half step to become minor, they go down a half step to become diminished. Perfect goes straight down to diminished. So, if, if, if I told you that Papa Haydn's dead and gone, whatever the word is, to the surprise symphony, and that's a third, bum, 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 that's a major third, or doorbell, da, da, um, is a backwards major third, either one of those, you don't even have to know them both, but Papa Haydn is a major third, if it was bum, 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 that would be a minor third, all you have to do is sink down a half step. That's a whole, it's a whole lot easier for me to know seven or eight things, know that I know them perfectly. A third looks like a third, looks like a third on the, on the score. So to figure out whether it's major or minor is maybe more involved than I think you should have to do when sight reading if it's in a, in a scale and most of what we do. I would memorize some of these. Frere Jaca, the fr da da, that's a major second. Chopsticks begins on a harmonic major second altogether, this sound. You, most of you probably heard some of this. Papa Haydn is a skip up. Old Anxiety is dum bum 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 one four. 
one, one, two, one, one, two, three, two, one, one, two, three, four, bum, 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 bum. Or, here comes the bride. Everyone's got that in their head. A perfect fifth is twinkle, twinkle, little star. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, bum, bum, bum. You got it. It came upon a, as, a, as a major six. You know what? Kids don't know my Bonnie lies over the ocean, I found out. That's a, that's a song of the past. But they do know it came upon a midnight clear. That's a major six. Now, a major seventh, it's funny because I thought, your book has 25 intervals and songs for them. It doesn't have a major seventh listed in there that I could find because they couldn't think of one. But I have one for you. It has to be the third note. Mally high, Mally low. South Pacific, don't we all know that? Bally, the first um, interval in that is a full octave. And the next note goes down to the seventh. I teach that as ugly, because that's just ugly. But that's the interval is a major seventh. So you need to know intervals. Now here's where I'm gonna talk to you a little bit. And I hope you can see this. Um, let's, let's I, don't, I don't think it matters which one we look at. Um, let's look at, at, at on, on exercise number five, the B. Um, you still need to look at the key signature. You still need to look at the time signature, which really doesn't have one here, but it's 4-4. Four, four. You still need to look at what key you're in, no matter what, so that you can get your tonality straight, in my opinion. You still need to count sing this before you start reading the pitches. But what I think you should read, if I were working on this piece and thinking intervals, I would be thinking, I've told you, checks for skips, right? I would say, that's a skip, that's a skip, and that's a skip. They're all line notes to me. So this is some kind of broken chord, you know? I may not be able to tell you exactly what kind of chord without more study, but with just looking at that for 33 seconds, I can tell you that we said line to line to line is a root position chord. Remember that? And you could add another third above that and have a seventh chord. That's some sort of seventh chord. The next thing I see out of this is that that note is the same as that note, which means it's a one, but it's an octave higher. Bum, uh, there, here you've got the, a B flat major seven. And then it adds the octave above that. So you're, you're doing nothing but singing a chord here and then the, uh, add the octave. You're coming back to the seventh. Bum, 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 bum. You're coming right back to that note. Anytime you can return to a note, and these are, these are, these are neighbors. Now your book is going to say to put a two here and a two here, and that's okay. They are neighbors, and that's a neighbor down, and that's a skip up. See my little checks. I like my little checks. And that's four notes apart. Remember we talked about on a fourth, you've got a space note and a line note, but they're pretty close together. That's four down. That's a skip down. That's a neighbor down. Do you see that? The second method of reading is more intervallic. I think it's useful at times. To me, you could go one, three, five, seven, one, or eight, or you can think skip, 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 which is awfully easy to read. I think skips, when they're line to line or space to space, are almost easier to sing as intervals with a third, thinking of the third, rather than naming what note degree it is. What do you see here? I see we're in the key of B flat, but you're starting on the neighbor up from that, which is a C. But what you're doing, space, line, space, line, space, line, space, line, you're going all the way up a C scale there. It's a C minor scale because you've got this E flat in here and stuff. But, but do you understand that these are all neighbors? Da, ba, 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 ba. You, do you understand though it's two, three, four, five, six? Because B flat is your number one. So a C would be on, on, on scale degree number two and all neighbors all the way up to C. A repeated C. Go down those three neighbors. You can put your little second there if you want to. An upper neighbor back to where you began on a B flat. I think that sight reading takes time to learn. I think that you need to be creative in your thinking. 
I think you need to think about intervals. I particularly think you should be thinking about broken chord intervals, which means line to line to line or space to space to space. Here's another, look, line to line to line, repeated note, neighbors up, octave down, put an eight there, repeated note, neighbor up, skip down, neighbor up. You've got to use both and, and of these techniques to help you with your sight reading. The most important thing I need to say to you about sight reading is practice it and spend the time to look at the score before you try to do it. Don't just sit down and say, I'm going to sing. You need to know what degree of the scale you're beginning on. And you need to know what the time signature is. It's helpful if you've already been through all the rhythmic problems so that that's easy for you. Then spend the time deciding, does it look like broken chords? Mark the repeats, mark the skips, what's left? It gets easier and easier. I've enjoyed working on these classes with you. I hope they're not too long and too boring, but I've tried to cover as much material as I could get to. I continue to learn. I hope you will continue to learn. I can't wait to be back together. Peace.